morning, everyone. Give a wave to the camera this morning. Everybody see how great you look. You look good. You look good. Ask your neighbor if they shoveled enough snow for the winter on Wednesday. Go ahead, ask your neighbor if they shoveled enough snow for the winter. Yeah. Yeah. We were talking about how great it was with all the little ones running around, all that energy. Well, I'm glad you're here this morning. Thank you for coming to church. Beautiful day. We're going to have communion together and we're going to have uh, our picture right after church outside on the steps. So uh, go ahead. Show your neighbor how you're going to smile for the picture this morning. Go ahead. Practice how you're going to smile for the picture this morning after church. Go ahead. Show them your smile. Go ahead. Do it. Good. Do it. I want to see. That's a kind of <laughs> Alright, alright. Some of you got your German smiles on. I don't know how that goes. I don't know how that goes. Actually, you had a pretty good life. But you were looking down at your phone and you missed it. Yeah. yeah anyway. Alright, that's the announcements. Uh, tomorrow night, board meeting, 7 o'clock here at church. And uh, I'm going to cancel cabbage burgers for this month, so you know that. We'll try again in March. Uh, we had some sign up, and that was pretty good, but uh, we're going to hold off on that. So thank you for understanding. Uh, anything else this morning? I think we're good. Birthdays. Me. Did he have a birthday? This coming Friday. This coming Friday? Go up here. Come 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 here, come here. Come here, come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. right here in front. Right here. Uh, That's good. Girls are kind of outnumbered, everybody. How many years are you going to be? Seven. I'm eight. Eight? Raise your hand if eight was a good year for you. Raise your hand if eight was a good year. How many of you are going to be eight? That was a good year. Let's see, when I was eight, I was cleaning the gutters every morning and every night in the milk bar for grandpa. Are you going to clean gutters? No. We can find some for you to clean. The chicken coop. What do you want for your birthday? A Hot Wheels monster truck. A Hot Wheels monster truck? How many want a Hot Wheels monster truck for your birthday? Yeah, I want one of those too. All right, let's see, any other birthdays? I had one yesterday. Am I more than eight? I'm not more than eight? Let's see, should we guess? 50, 56, you got it. Woo! Oh, the youngster. Dan? Carly, when was your birthday? Carly. Happy birthday, Carly. All right, anybody else? Okay, we, we like a we like a barbaric German happy birthday. Okay. Yeah. So we want to hear everybody growl for a moment, all right? So on the count of three, everybody growl. Get your voices ready. One, two, three. Ooh, they sound pretty good. Are you ready for this? All right, a barbaric German happy birthday. Let's sing it. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Greg? Did you hear his speech, Glenn? Bev and I have been happily married for 32 years. He just left out the bliss word. 
Glenn Ann's and Bliss were Thirty-two, congratulations. Congratulations. All right, anybody else? John? Lee and I are the 20th. 20th? 20 years? No, it's October 20th. Oh, October 20th. How many years? 14, I believe. 14. Does he believe correctly? <laughs> we operate on the same page. Yeah, yeah. Get your phone out and look back at the picture see what that was. Whatever there are. Hey, congratulations. Thank you. All right, anybody else? All right, let's sing happy anniversary this morning to these two happily married blissful couples. Happy anniversary to you. Today we got to make one note about this. The boxes are at the back. They're due the 15th of November. 15th of November. So remember how to fold, fold, and fold. And it'll be fine. Also, the labels are on the back table. So uh, take as many of those boxes as you'd like to fill. We do have more of them in the office. So we'll get those out if we need to. Thank you, Teresa, for getting those for us. Okay, so Operation Shoebox starts. They're due November 15th. So if you want to take boxes today, you can do that, okay? All right. Other than that, any other giving beyond your normal giving you want to give for missions, um, you can label an envelope and tell where you'd like that to go. We have uh, those different items we'd like to think about. Military Bible sticks, audio Bibles, World Vision, um, any canned goods you'd like to bring. Are we accepting those now, Marge, for Care and Share? So you can bring any items for Care and Share. And then Gideon Bibles. So note those items we can give for missions. Okay? All right. Glad you're here. You look good. So Mrs. Gordon wants to come up and give a disclaimer real quick. Come here, Mrs. Gordon. I told Matt, I told Matt I would take full responsibility for last Sunday. I looked at him on Friday after the week we had had, and uh, I haven't had up and down this much in my life for a long time. And I said, Matt, I can't do Sunday. I said, you have to give us a break. We have to have one day home before Monday starts, and we have to make a gazillion billion decisions on Monday. So I will take that responsibility for saying, oh, I can't do it. So he looked at me Sunday night, though, he said, Thank you. Thank you for telling us just to be home. So, thank you for understanding. Um, yeah. Anyways, um, many of you asked. I'll do a real quick update. Um, Tuesday we had the meeting at the hospital with the doctors and said, your mom's not wanting to eat anymore. Um, she can't really talk anymore. What do you want to decide? We had that meeting. Um, I told her, if you bring her back and she wants to go to heaven, I will be in so much trouble. And my sister said she plays Ding Dong Ditch It with Evan, and she did that this week, and she has come back. She rang the doorbell for a moment, and then she's, her mind came back, and she's, um, looks like her, and how you can tell when they look like themselves. My dad, we put in the care center on Wednesday in Lusk. Uh, my mom just can't do it. If God allows her to go home, we don't know if that's the route yet, um, she can't do it anymore, and we get it. We hauled him around for a week, and he just his memory is not there enough for us to be able to work full time and handle. So that's where we're at. She's ready to rock and roll, and um, tomorrow we'll be making that decision. We may move her to the uh, swing bed in Lusk just to buy us some time as we work with Medicaid and we figure out where she lives and those kind of things. So pray for us. We're not done with decisions yet. But today everybody's safe and well, and we're good. So thank you for your prayers. I have helped them. We have helped them. Yes, yes. And Mrs. Gordon looks okay, doesn't she? <laughs> yeah. she looks okay. yeah, she's done good this week, I'll tell you. So it's been quite a week. Hey, raise your hand if you've been in our situation. <laughs> Taking care. Look at this, Mrs. Gordon. Look. And that's what I meant last week when I said all of you have done this, or most of you, and 
Because of that, that gave great strength to us. I can't even tell you that. To be able to say, oh, but I know this, and I know this, and I know them, and I know that. And I just can't tell you enough thank you. So good job taking care of your parents through all of this, and thank you for being gracious uh, with our situation as well. So look at your neighbor and say, get an end game together. Go ahead, tell your neighbor, get an end game together. Go ahead, tell your neighbor, get an end game together. So, uh, you know, you don't need it for a while right now. Just get it ready. Get it ready. So, oh, a quick update on my father. He's gone from uh, Staples Hospital to uh, Care Center in Minneapolis to the emergency room in Memorial Hospital, which is an interesting dilemma. I didn't know this was going on. In the big cities like Minneapolis, Memorial Hospital is a big place. And my sister had to take him to the ER. And when she got there, people are waiting in the ER for 10 hours. It's an average of 10 hour wait when you go to the emergency room. At midnight, they stop running ambulances in Minneapolis. There's no more ambulance service after midnight. So she got him there, she gets him to the hospital because he started to run a fever. And so the care center said he couldn't stay there anymore. So his foot is the infection problem that's bad and they're not getting it solved and it's just a crazy deal. But so they finally took him back in the ER and she waved goodbye to him and he ended up in a hospital room somewhere for five more days and now he went back to the care center and we don't know what after that. So it's just been a crazy mess for him too. So thank you for praying. Thank you for praying and for your messages and your love and all of that. Um, my sister is taking care of him and it's been really interesting. Dad's mind is sound somewhat. <laughs> After these kind of experiences, he, he gets in those situations just like you would be and I would be. He's frustrated. And he says, sometimes I have to apologize to the nurses because I get grouchy. And I say, well, at least you're apologizing. He says, yes. I usually tell him this way. I'm going to get mad at you, so I'm going to apologize ahead of time. <laughs> and then they start working on his foot, and he gets mad at them, and then they laugh. So it's been pretty good so far, but it's crazy like that. So you've been there. Many of you know exactly what we're talking about, and I thank you for understanding and, and for being with us. I just love that. It's amazing, amazing. All right, let's... Uh, Let's have our service this morning. I've been looking forward to being with you today um, because of communion time and singing and worshiping. And I've just been, I missed you last week. Thank you. I missed you. And thank you for understanding. Thank you. We're on missions month. How do we help people go to heaven? So this is a funny story. I'll give you one about dad. When he goes to places, he always talks to people about Jesus, right? And if he's in a, in a hospital room and you're there with him, you, he had, thinks he has a captive audience and, and you, you want him to talk to you about Jesus. That's what he thinks. And so when he was there in the last hospital room, he had a gentleman named Steve who also had a bad foot. So they were together. And he figured that Steve wanted to hear him talk about Jesus. And so he talked to Steve about Jesus until Steve finally said, you know what? I do want to know Jesus. And so in the hospital room, when you have bad feet, you get to pray with people to go to heaven even if your foot's bad, right? So think about that. What do I do when I'm in the hospital? What do I do when I'm talking to people? And uh, Dad's a good example for me and for us to think about. So sharing Jesus is one of the things he likes to talk about and he likes to think about. So when you think about where you're at, who shared Jesus with you, and then how will you share the love of Jesus with somebody this week? How are you going to do that, right? All right, I want you to turn to the hymnal, number 483. I want to sing this song. I want you to stand with me. And this is a great song, Faith. I love it.
When you hug mom, that means you'll get increase your allowance. So that's our privilege as a Christian, something we do. Someone did it for us. Jesus came and told us about a way to heaven. The disciples carried the message. Many over the years have done that. And so we get to do the same. That's what Missions Month is about, carrying the message of Jesus that he came to save us, to rescue us. Isn't that right? Yeah. So we do that for others. Hey, we want to sing this song, Nobody Loves Me Like You.
as Christians, we help people go to heaven. That's our job. We, we hold the sign. We had crossed over. Uh, I was going to town the other day to Scott's Bluff, and when I got to Mitchell, the lady came walking out in the middle of the road with that stop sign, you know, after school. And I thought, she's pretty brave. Here are semis coming, and here are trucks moving, and cars going, right? And that road is busy. And she just walks right out there holding that stop sign like she owns the whole world. I thought about that. As Christians, we should have a sign that we walk out in the middle of the street once in a while and say, an arrow pointing up, make sure you're going to heaven, right? Because we don't know when that moment is, do we? That's our job as Christians. We get to hold the sign for where heaven is and how people get there. Hey, we want to sing this song, My Life is You.
He forgave my sins. Amen? Amen. He saved me from eternal separation from God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he gives me everlasting life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Time to pray. Time to pray. Boys and girls. Father, thank you for the boys and girls today. They look great, aren't they beautiful? And you made them that way. So God, I pray your blessings on them. Your love over them and your protection always. Keep them. Bless them. Love them. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us. We pray the Lord's Prayer with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's sing. Katie Martin today, so I can use all those kids. on your way out. We need more. We have plenty more of those, so if you want to take a couple of them, you're welcome to do that. We want to pray this morning for each other. And uh, I guess i got to tell you about your prayers. Your prayers are such a blessing. So this week, throughout different times, many of you have sent little text messages, right? And I've been praying for you, and I think God, they've got big troubles going on in their world, and I want you to bless them. And about that same time that I'm praying for you, inevitably what comes on my text is a message from you that says, I'm praying for you. And I think, how does God do that all the time? About the same time I'm thinking, I'm praying for you, and you send me something, you're praying for me, and I think, this, this is an incredible moment. i got to let you know this. You see, the one who orchestrates all this, we don't see him, and he's in between all of us. He's better than the interweb. Right? Because for some reason, those messages are coming back and forth, and he knows every one of those prayer chains, those prayer lines, because all of the prayers go where first? They go to heaven first, and then they come down. And it's just remarkable. I'm not very good at usually sharing about prayer requests and letting people be part of our world. I like to be kind of private sometimes, right? But as we've opened our door this week and you said those prayers, I've discovered the, the, the great help it is in carrying burdens when you know other people are praying for you. And sometimes I'm a doubter about that. Sometimes, I'll admit it, I'm a doubter. I sometimes wonder if my prayers are really helping you that much. And then when this week happens and your prayers are coming our way, I say, Lord, forgive me for being a Thomas, right? Because I realize how much 
The load is lifted as you pray for somebody and you pray for us. So I really can't be a doubter anymore. I can't. And Jesus said he would forgive me for that. But when I pray for you, now I know that God's helping to lift that burden. So this morning we're going to talk about that in church, how these burdens happen and how they get lifted. So I want to say thank you for praying for us. And uh, it's extraordinary what God has helped do in just two weeks. And, and your prayers mean so much. So thank you for that. Thank you. Will you elbow your neighbor hard in the shoulder and say, thanks for praying for Pastor Matt. And go ahead, elbow him hard. And tell him thanks for praying. And tell him thank you for praying. Yeah. I pray for you. And it's amazing how God brings you to mind and to heart. So we want to pray. We're praying for Glenda. She's got a bad eyeball. Everybody know that? Glenda's having trouble seeing. She wants to put her head on Margie's shoulder all the time. Because she has to keep her head sideways. We're praying for Mary's family, her daughter Cindy. Going through those struggles, cancer battles. Praying for Andy Anderson, Carol's brother-in-law. We're praying for Janice Dinas, who's been in the hospital now for almost three weeks, I think. She had her hip, she had a hip replaced, and then she fell and broke her hip, and then they fixed it again, and then they found out her other foot was fractured. So she's been wearing a boot to physical therapy while she's trying to get her hip going on the other side. She's supposed to come home maybe Tuesday. So we're praying for Janice and for Leonard. Leonard has eye problems as well. So we think about those burdens in life and how their people are recovering. Greg, he's been having eye problems for a long time. Is it getting better yet, Greg? We don't know. Every day is a blessing. Every day is a blessing. We know that. Gene, we prayed for him for a long time. Joyce, you look better. Joyce fell and she got some black and blue on her, but she came. I love that. Thank you, Joyce. <clears throat> now we go down this side. <laughs> Stop. Okay. We're the well side. <laughs> Sandy Lutz's son passed away, and he was 42. The service is today at 2 o'clock this afternoon. They're having a memorial for him out at the house with friends and family. It's at the, it's the Legion. Oh, it's at the Legion more. Okay. So we pray for Sandy and her family. They're really struggling. Yeah. And then uh, we pray for Kevin and Lynette. We remember them. Jessica's wedding was on Friday up in Rapid City. And Kevin had been bothering his new son-in-law, Garrett, a lot. He would keep saying, I don't know if we're going to have a wedding. Garrett would kind of look at him, and Kevin would say, I haven't seen a goat yet. Uh-huh. Mistake, right? Kevin even said it at the rehearsal Thursday night. I don't know. I haven't seen a goat yet. So Friday at the wedding, there was a goat at the front of the ceremony. Now you got to know about it. That goat was right there at the front of when Kevin walked in with his daughter for this majestic wedding moment. Kevin was like looking at the goat, but not looking at the goat. He was trying not to pretend that it wasn't there. And so before he gave his daughter away, his new son-in-law gave him a goat. And periodically throughout the ceremony, at just the right moments, we would hear, nah. <laughs> so we pray for them, this new couple married. If you don't have something to pray about, just call, right? We pray about family situations and jobs for people and all kinds of things are going on. So thank you for praying, for being the people who pray. So we want to do that. So bow your hearts and your head with me this morning. <clears throat> Almighty Father in heaven, living Lord Jesus and Holy Spirit, 
we come before you, the great God of heaven, of the universe and this whole world. And in the chaos of it all, we know, God, that you are there. You are not surprised. You are not bewildered. You are not feeling out of control. Everything is as you would have it, God. And we are grateful that you know right where we are this morning. Your hand of love, mercy, and compassion has come to us numerous times, not just once or twice. God, you have carried us, you have helped us, you have given us more than we even know sometimes. And with that in our hearts, we say thank you as a gracious, as a people who are grateful for your graciousness. Lord Jesus, today we come together in church, we'll have communion, and we remember all that you did for us. You're coming to this life to walk among men, to show us the truth of how our salvation can happen. And you told us just by believing that you are the Son of God, our sins will be forgiven and we shall have a place in heaven. And then you told us, Lord, that you will go and prepare a place for us, a place for all eternity where we can be there and, and be happy and fulfilled and, in ways we never could understand while we're on this side of heaven. But Lord Jesus, you made a way for us to go to heaven. And that's our great hope for ourselves personally and then for us to share that story with the world around us. Holy Spirit, you bring to us comfort and you bring to us guidance. You bring to us wisdom. You bring to us the truth. You bring to us so many details throughout the day. You, you bring to us the voice of who to pray for and, and what Bible verses mean. You, you give us all of this understanding of what happens in heaven. Holy Spirit, we are grateful that you have come to live within us today. So thank you. Thank you, God of heaven, for caring about us. Lord, with that, we've mentioned many prayer requests this morning, and Father, you know those requests, and you know the burdens of people, and you know the joys of people. So I would ask that as we pray today, Father, you would listen to the voices of each one here and the prayers in their heart and that, God, you would answer those prayers and you would help. That you would lift our burdens, that you would be the God who guides our paths. And, Father, we would ask to always, each day, put our lives into your path, into your care, and know that you'll take care of it. So thank you, Lord. Thank you for blessing and being with us and for your help and healing and your love and your compassions. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I want you to take your Bibles this morning. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 11, please. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. If you ask to read those out loud with your neighbor, who's the invitation given to you is the question. Who's the invitation given to you? All right, go ahead. Read that out loud with your name. Read Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Just a couple verses, okay? Go, go, go. Read it. Today. 
talking during missions time, a reason to share Jesus. And I think about this. Christians, we don't carry our burdens alone. And this is one of the reasons to share Jesus. We get to help each other. So we don't have to carry our burdens alone. See, somebody brought somebody up. Isn't that the way it works? Somebody brought somebody to help somebody to find somebody. I like that. They know where they're going. Jesus said in Luke chapter 19, I have come to seek and to save that which is lost. He's looking for people who are looking for him. And that's the truth about our world is everywhere. So today I want to talk about these three items. Three ways that Christians are carrying their burdens. Is it okay to talk about this this morning? So look at number one. Number one says recognize each burden and call them out. We're going to talk about what that means in my mind, in my heart, and how we do that. Number two, we've got to let Jesus help us. And number three, let my Christian family help me. That's so important. So number one, the ways Christians are to carry burdens. First, I want to talk about recognizing each burden and calling them out. I got some pictures to show you. I don't think she's actually holding that rock. Do you? What do you think? Is she really holding that? If she is, she's strong, isn't she, on her back like that? So on the rock, there's different things it says. Dead, family, jobs, and on and on the idea goes. So we want to think about a couple of burdens maybe that you have going on in your life right now. From medical to whatever they might be. What are some things that are kind of weighing on you in a, in a way that we refer to as a burden? I kind of like this next picture. I'm not sure how true it is, but look at that picture. The guy's pulling his own head around on a cart. Have you ever felt that way? The heaviest burdens we carry are thoughts in our head. I don't know if that's actually true, except this happened. And this happened a lot for the last two weeks. About 2.35 in the morning, I would wake up. Anybody do that in the middle of the night? 2.35, I wake up. I should start texting all of you at 2.35. 2.35, we wake up in the middle of the night. Number one, we've got to use the restroom because, you know, we're older. Yeah, here, i got to do that, right? Then I go back and lay down and think, oh, God, I'll go back to bed. And all of a sudden, what happens? One thing starts, and pretty soon I'm thinking about one, and that rolls into the next one, mm -hmm. and it's almost like these wheels or cogs start to unravel, and each one starts clicking, and before I know it, I have about 13 different cogs rolling in my head. Some of you are shaking your head. Go ahead, raise your hand if your neighbor does this in the middle of the night, too. Go ahead, raise your hand if your neighbor can't sleep. After they get up, because they're thinking about things that they have no control over at 2.35 in the morning. So I stop being a godly man like I am, right? I stop and I start to say, okay, Lord, let's just put those away and I'll go to sleep now. And then I look around. And I'm still awake. It doesn't matter if I'm a godly man or not, I guess. Maybe I'm not as godly as I think I am. Now that's wheel number 14 starts rolling in my head. Right? I don't know why that happens to us. Why we start to process the events of the day or the things that are supposed to happen. But when all of those cogs get spinning, I start to feel overwhelmed. You ever get that overwhelmed feeling? There's too many things going on in my mind. So it's not just about having one burden that's causing me some distress at 2.35 in the morning. It's about having multiple burdens that are starting to pile on top of each other because I'm trying to sort out, my brain is trying to sort out which ones to get rid of first. What should I do first? You ever do that? And it seems like there's too many coming too fast and I need to take care of multiple ones at the same time. But I just, for some reason, am not going to be able to do that. That's when you hit the overwhelm moment and things have to change. Something has to separate or break. Something has to divide out somehow. So I was looking at these. Now these aren't an actual breakdown of how they work in our mind or heart. But what I like about this graphic is it gives you some of these ideas or thoughts about it. So let me just read through them. Starting at the top in green. Sin, addiction, or lies. Things in my own personal religious life that may be bothering me. Number two, pain, disappointment from my past. 
things that come back to me that maybe need to be solved. Number three, anger, grudge, pride, or jealousy. Stuff I'm dealing with in my emotions today. The bottom one, the big one on the bottom says fear, worry, doubt, or anxiety. That's just where I'm putting a lot of stuff in to my life and I don't know how to sort it out. The little purple one says control. I want to let God control my plans. Only 5% of me really wants that. The rest of me says, i got to control it. i got to take care of it. Look at the blue, 8%, financial, job worries. 10% in the orange, insecurities, allowing others' opinions to influence me. Then that little blue stripe up in the corner, wasted time, laziness, distractions, procrastination, or 2.35 in the morning, I'm up worried about this forever. That's that little one. I just look at my attitude towards all of this and the frustrations we may be feeling. These are, these are not actual breakdowns of how they work in our life. But these are just items that may exist at 2.35 in the morning. How do you sort that out? How do you start to decompartmentalize these things and, and be able to handle some of them? I don't know what they are in your life. So how does calling out the burdens really help us? How does it really help us? In the Bible, whenever there is a battle, the enemy is always identified. I'll give you just a couple of examples. Think of a battle in the Bible. David and Goliath. Well, Goliath was for sure identified, right? The whole Israeli army knew this man, he was nine foot, six inches tall approximately, was standing there, weighed over 420 pounds, and he had called out to the Israelite army, I want someone to come out and fight me. If not, we win the battle. And so God had a great plan. He had a little shepherd boy who brought some cheese and crackers and bread for his brothers who were in the military, right? He shows up. He's 12 years old. And he looks around at all the Israeli soldiers standing there, and he listens to this giant of a man who's mocking God. And David himself had already defeated lions and bears and kept the sheep safe. And he looked across the field at that mountain of a man. He says, well, I'll go take him down. 12 years old. That would be a 6th or 7th grader. Do we have any 6th or 7th graders here? And there goes David down into the valley. He gets to the stream in the middle and he picks up five stones. The five stones he picks up, does he need five stones? No. How many does he use? He picks up five stones, which represent the five laws of the Bible, the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And as he picks those five rocks up, he's saying to God in heaven, we're going to go knock him down. There wasn't a question in David's heart. He puts those five stones in his little knapsack. I like to call it a man purse. It's like a fanny bag. You got a fanny bag? He walks over and he looks at Goliath, puts one stone in his sling and he starts it spinning. And in the next moment, nine foot six inches tall is laying on the ground. We know the rest of the story, don't we? I don't know. Lots of times I don't have enough faith to deal with nine foot six inches tall, let alone to deal with needing a few tasks done around the house. We call them out. David called out. He knew who Goliath was, and there he stood. Jesus in the wilderness in the New Testament with Satan. Jesus went out for 40 days and 40 nights. He was in the wilderness. He was praying and fasting, and Satan came to him and brought these temptations. And Jesus says right to him, Satan, we're not going to do this. I'm not giving in to you on any one of those temptations. Jesus said no. We call them out. So as I call out my burdens, I begin to organize the things that are taking place in my life for that moment. You do that too. Your mind does it at 2.35 in the morning. If you'll write them down and say, these are the items that need to be taken care of. Lord, these are the things on my heart, on my head, on my burdens, on my back. These are the things I'm looking at trying to solve. And I write them down one at a time. And as I have that list before me, I get to pray about it. God, how can you help me with this one? God, how can you help me with this one? Some of them are just between God and I, and he needs to help me with them. But sometimes he brings a name to mind, and he says, oh, this person can help you with this one. And then I have to make a choice, don't I? 
Am I going to get on the phone and am I going to call somebody to come and help me with that burden? That's the hard part, isn't it? Go ahead, elbow your German, stubborn German neighbor. Elbow him hard and say, sometimes we have to ask our neighbor for help. Sometimes we have to. I'm not bragging about them, but I'm very thankful. So last Sunday, some people showed up at our house who were part of our family. And they checked off five things on my list in just a few hours. Five things were off my list. And I couldn't have done it without them. Because the morning I started saying to myself, what am I going to do first? Right? Have you been there? What should I do first? And you start to get overwhelmed that you're not going to get anything done. Because everything starts falling apart, doesn't it? We organize them, we call them out. These are some aspects of a balanced life that God gave to us. Our social aspect, our physical aspect, professional, pleasure times, mental, spiritual, emotional, material. These are all aspects in our world that have to be somehow kind of put in place and okay. These are things God helps us with. To organize them. To help us say, I'm okay. So a lot of people ask, how are you doing? What do we say? I don't say great. Say, we're okay. What does that mean? I mean, everything's still a little out of whack, but we're still okay. Right? Are you like that? Go ahead, ask your neighbor, how you doing? Ask your neighbor and see what they say. Go ahead, ask him. How you doing? Ask him. Ask him, right? What'd they say? Did they say okay? Did they say great? We're doing awesome? All right, that's why we call out our burdens, is to put life in perspective, to try and organize it so we can accomplish those burdens one at a time. Number two, second way that Christians are to carry their burdens. First one is to recognize our burdens, call them out or organize them, put them into a plan. Number two, let Jesus help. If you look at the verses we just read, Matthew chapter 11, you have your Bible open? Matthew 11, 25 through 30, Jesus gives us an invitation to help us carry the burdens. This is spiritual burdens in our life. But more than that, he can lift us out of pits of despair and depression and anxiety. He can help do that, and he does that for us when we give ourselves to him. Look at these words. <coughs> Just consider all the things that weigh down our hearts and lives. Death and loss and illness, worry, politics, financial, hardships, grief, guilt. Marital tensions, traumatic events, each a weight that we carry on our shoulders. Many of these burdens are inevitable and entirely outside our realm of control. Life is not easy. Will you tell your neighbor that? Life is not easy. Tell your neighbor, life is not easy. The truth of it is, so how does knowing Jesus help us as Christians deal with these kind of situations? Have you ever asked that question of him? Jesus, how does knowing you really help with these situations? So I want to go through Matthew 11 for just a moment. He gives us some secrets here. Look at verses 25 and 26. Jesus begins this little discourse, this invitation. He says, verse 25, At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father. He's praying. Jesus himself is praying to the Father in heaven. This is a clue for us. When life gets to be that way, what should we do? We should stop and pray to the Father. He says, at that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned, and you have revealed them to who? To children. Look at verse 26. Yes, Father, for this is your good pleasure. I think about it. The faith of a child, it's simple faith in God. We come to him and we pray for his app and ask for his help in a complicated situation. But I like this. Dan and I were talking a couple weeks ago. It's so interesting how so many times, as adults, we take a simple thing and we do what to it? We make it complicated, don't we? We make it so much harder and bigger than it really is. And yet the faith of a child twists that the other way. 
If I take some of my thoughts and concerns at 2.35 in the morning and I give them to my grandchildren and they read them, you know what they're going to say? Go back to sleep. That's exactly right. Big deal. What's so hard about that? God's got it. I make it overcomplicated sometimes in my mind and I twist it into something that seems almost impossible. But it's not. Think about God's view every day looking at the world with almost 8 billion people on the planet and all of us are running around dealing with so many crazy things. That's God's view every day. And does he ever feel overwhelmed or out of control with it all? No, he doesn't. So first I need to go back to my faith and I need to say, God, I have faith like a child that you can help. Right? God, you can help. Look at verse 27. Jesus says, all things have been committed to me by my Father. In other words, Jesus is saying, I can handle all of this stuff for you. I can help you with all of this. It's not just a few things that I have available to me. I have all things. So think about the powers of heaven that Jesus has available. All the angels of heaven are at his command. If he needs to send a few angels our way to help out, do you think he does it? Yeah, he does. If he needs to help us in some storms, can he calm the water? Yeah, he can do that. Jesus says, all these things have been given to me by my Father. I can take care of all this. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And God chose to reveal himself to us through his Son. We get to know God. Don't forget how important that is. Every day, we get to know God. Lastly, 28 through 30, you read this together. This is the invitation. So Jesus says, because of this, as your faith as a child, and because I have all these things committed to me and can help you, I'm going to give you this invitation. Come to me. Come to me. It should be my first stop on the bus ride, shouldn't it? It should be the first building I'm going to go to. It should be the first place. It should be the first moment. Now when I'm feeling that burden or something going on, I should stop and say, Lord Jesus, I'm coming to you first. He says, come to me, every one of you who have some tiredness, or you're weary, or you're feeling some stresses in life. Come to me if you're carrying burdens that are part of this world that have been put upon you. And he says, I will give you what? I will give you rest. At 2.35 in the morning, I learned a trick. My phone plays the Bible, right? And it reads it to you. So at 2.35 in the morning, I have to play it quietly because I don't want to make, wake my honey up, right? Because then all of a sudden, she'll get a little upset at me too. So at 2.35 in the morning, if I play my Bible voice, have you done that? That puts you to sleep in like two minutes. That guy reading the Bible to you, and go to some part of the Bible like Leviticus, <laughs> and you'll be asleep in no time. Because for some reason, hearing God's word in the middle of the night, it doesn't help to sort things out, but it helps to give us a sense of rest. A peace, a reflection on the one who takes care of it. So now at 2.35 in the morning, I pray, listen to the Bible, and you know what I do? I go back to sleep. Come to me, you all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Psalm 23 tells us that. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Look at these pictures. We know what a yoke looks like and how they're supposed to pull. We get the idea of the yoke and how it's balanced in, in life. We also get the idea of an unequal yoke. Look at this one. Is they going to pull the same way? 
No, and sometimes I feel like, you know, I'm the bull and where's Jesus? He hasn't showed up yet. And then he turns around and says, no, I'm the bull and you're the dumb donkey, right? <laughs> There's other words for that. Be careful what you imply, but think about it. I think I'm pulling all this weight and really he's been doing it all along. And I'm the dumb. So where are we at in this whole thing? When we come to Jesus, we don't even have to think that I'm going to pull the same amount of weight he's pulling. He's going to help us. He's going to help us. Recognize the burdens that we have. Call them out or write them out. Number two, ask Jesus to help. Number three, let our Christian family help. Go to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6 in the Bible has this really remarkable verse. Really remarkable verses for us. Galatians chapter 6. Carry each other's burdens, and in the way you will fulfill the law of Christ. So, Galatians chapter 6 says, Brothers, if someone is caught in sin, you, are, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Verse 2, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Verse 3, if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Each one should test his own his own actions, then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to somebody else. Verse 5, for each one should carry his own load. Now this verse talks to us in Galatians chapter 6 about carrying each other's burdens. That's where we share our prayers. But we don't make your burdens my burdens. My burdens are mine, and I won't make my burdens your burdens. We each carry our own burdens, but we share in each other's burdens by praying and helping as we can. God gives us these burdens to carry. And he allows them to make us stronger. Here's the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? You say two laws. Number one, love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, right? You know that one. What's law number two? Love your neighbor as yourself. When we help carry each other's burdens, we're fulfilling law number two of Christ. We help carry each other's burdens. Same way with sharing Jesus with each other. Griswold said this, At this time, let us be exceedingly mindful that bearing one another's burdens and sharing one another's suffering is an integral to being members of Christ's body. I got some pictures I saw of people sharing each other's burdens. And you know what I see about each one of these? There's always more than one person, isn't there? There's always more than one. We're not alone. We're not alone. My burdens, I said already to many of you who've helped your parents along the way, you're doing what you did to help me. Do any of us have any problems that are unique only to us in this whole world? We're not alone. We're not alone. Three ways we carry our burdens. Number one, recognize each burden and call them out. Write them down. Let them get organized so we can deal with them and God can help us. Number two, let Jesus help. Come to him. First stop. First stop after you organize those burdens. Number three, then let our Christian family help. Help. So here's what we did. We named our burdens. We asked Jesus to help us. And I say thank you to you for praying and for helping us. That is why we help people go to heaven. So these burdens can be lifted. I know it's a little late this morning, but I'm so thankful to be able to share this with you. And I want to share communion with you as well. So deacons, if you would come, please. From the hands of Jesus this morning, we're going to share communion together. From the hands of Jesus. I'm going to ask you to turn in your hymnal to number 159. And we're going to share the bread this morning. Number 159.
verse 2. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke the bread and he gave thanks to his Father. As you hold that bread in your hand, we give thanks to God. With faith, like a child, we know he hears us, we know he is with us, and we know he helps us. With faith, like a child. Don't make it more complicated than it is. It's simple. Jesus said, I am the bread, the bread of life. As we take this bread today, we know it represents the body of Jesus which was broken for us. And he brings healing to our mind, our bodies, and our souls. He brings the healing. Let's partake together. Thank you, Jesus, for the healing you bring to us today through your body, through your bread, which was given for us. We receive this as we remember all that you have done for us in Jesus' name. The same way after supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is a new covenant which is poured out for me. Has to come. We're going to turn in our chorus book to number 217. There is a redeemer. There is a Yeah. 
He likes to sing. Jesus gave us this cup to remember him. He wanted you to know one thing. And one of the burdens in life should not be our sin and our guilt and our shame. Those things are gone because of the blood of Jesus. We don't carry those. That's not a burden for us to have. Jesus died on the cross, and when he did, he said, I take that sin, and I'll take that shame, and I'll take that guilt. Those are not your burdens anymore. So give those to him. Give those to him. In God's eyes, we are <clears throat> in God's eyes. Own that today. Let's take the cup together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your gift to us of the bread and the cup to remind us to remind us of the great forgiveness we have in you, Jesus and that our sins are gone and that the place in heaven is waiting for us someday whenever you're ready our place in heaven is waiting Amen Turn your hymn to number 482. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. We're going to sing and then we're going to go outside and get a picture taken. You look beautiful. Everything's all right. 482. When the Lord is called up yonder, I'll be there. Let's sing together. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, the time shall be no more. And the Lord he breaks eternal right and fair. Steps. Verse 3, and I'll meet you out there. Thanks for coming to church this day. Verse 3. Let us labor for the master.